All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for attending our meetup number 16. And tonight, uh, we will be discussing um, Snap ML and H2 Diverless AI um, with our speaker, um, Gilbert Thomas. So before we actually go ahead on to the actual talk, um, just some few reminders um, regarding the meetup. So um, if you are not familiar yet with Zoom, um, you can use the chat box so that you can actually send a message to everyone or privately to our participant. So you can also um, message us on the panelists so you can like, select um, which person or if you would want to direct some of your questions or inquiries um, to us, you can just message us on the chat box. For your Q&A, so you also can see on your Zoom a Q&A box. So you can send your question through the Q&A box so we can answer those questions um, at the end of the actual talk webinar. So before we formally start, I would just like to have a quick introduction to what we do as AI Filipinas. So AI Filipinas, we are formerly um, a TensorFlow and Machine Learning Philippines community. So we're relatively a group who is contributing to the Philippine ecosystem to help upscale tech capabilities and train professionals and students to learn artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the skills can actually be used for either research purposes or be used in the industry in which you can actually leverage the capabilities of machine learning and to bridge the gap of understanding um, industry solutions and also research capabilities in the academy. So we have at around 1,600 members um, via the Facebook group. So if you're not part yet of our Facebook group, you can just go visit fb.com slash groups slash AI Filipinas. And uh, we are also on Meetup. So we have at around 800 plus members there. So we usually announce our first, our, our event via Meetup. So if you're a part of the Meetup page, um, you can immediately receive an invitation to our events. Uh, and we... Uh, you can just go visit meetup.com slash AI Filipinas to be part of that community. So we've been doing events um, since uh, 2017. So we've been in different places across the Philippines, um, doing training, discussing um, different technologies. Uh, we have also like host uh, huge events, um, such as the Tensor Product Summit uh, way back in 2018. Uh, for 2019, we have been doing a lot of physical meetups um in different locations partnering with different um, organizations such as microsoft um, google and um, other organizations who are keen to help us grow the community and we're also inviting a lot of speakers also from, who came from different backgrounds who are willing to help us grow and um, improve the community itself so last year we also host our first ever machine learning hackfest in which uh, we invited a lot of participants, um, practitioners, um, students, and professionals to actually um, lend their skills and talent to help NGOs on how they can leverage the capabilities or use AI and machine learning to improve their work. So for our coming events, um, so we have our meetup number 17 next week on, on a schedule on June 30, 7 p.m. So if you are keen to understand um, AI and uh, be able to teach some concepts of that for kids. Um, don't hesitate to join us next week. Um, you can just go visit bit.ly slash Filipinas meetup 17. And um, we will be hosting our meetup number 18 on July 15 um, together with Pi and AI. So we will be covering um, and discussing towards how you can actually start navigating or start crafting your career in artificial intelligence. We invited a panel of speakers um, from Asian Development Bank, Security Bank, um, CENTI, and Zero Six Data Science to talk about their experiences on how they were able to build um, their career, what are the challenges that they have encountered as they navigate themselves into understanding and doing machine learning projects. 
Um, we will be discussing um, or we'll be posting on the Facebook group also and the meetup page the um, link. So please stay tuned on that. And if you would want to be a speaker um, for a future event, um, don't hesitate to just go over bit.ly AIPDP-speakers. Um, if you would want to share your knowledge and time with us, we would be happy to host you over at one of our meetups. So um, just to share a community guidelines. So I think since we're part of all of the same community, so um, everyone is advised to be friendly, uh, be welcoming, and generally be a nice person, be someone that other people want to be around. Uh, be respectful um, and constructive. Uh, we are a very diverse group so that uh, probably it's possible that we don't agree all the time, but we should be able to be still uh, respectful and provide constructive criticisms uh, and be constructive in our communication with our fellow peers. So uh, be collaborative. So that's uh, always what we push in the community. So if you would want to volunteer your time as well with us, um, we'll be opening our hands or we embrace you with open hands and um, just message us on um, Facebook if you would want to share your time with us and share your knowledge with us. And um, this, is us, this is our community, so be part of it. So you are encouraged to join in discussions. If there's something that is interesting that you can share to the community, if you have any projects that you would like to share and get feedback, um, please do share all of those important announcements or important happenings um, on, on the machine learning on our Facebook page or on our Meetup page. So yeah, um, again, just to revisit our webinar rules and guidelines, again, you can use a chat box if you want to message to everyone or privately, and you can use a Q&A to send your, your questions through the Q&A box. So we will be um, answering the, the questions later. Um, I will be moderating and asking all of those questions um, to our panel speaker for tonight. So um, let's get to know our speaker. So our speaker for tonight is a technical sales lead at IBM Cognitive Systems ASEAN. Um, he specializes in providing AI solutions, both hardware and software, to solve business problems. His business, his background spans the field of defense, research, financial services, and genomics, and presented at numerous partner and customer conferences such as NVIDIA, Tech Data. A star and Ingram on the topic of application of AI, machine learning, deep learning in the enterprise. This is very interesting. He believes that deep learning and AI is a massive game changer and that enterprises should look at leveraging them to gain a competitive edge. Let's uh, welcome our speaker for the night, um, Gilbert Thomas. Hi, Gilbert. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. I uh, really appreciate the introduction. Um, I wanted to do a deduction myself, but then since you already did it, um, I think I can skip that part. I uh, probably just wanted to add one more thing. Um, I started out in high performance computing or HPC. So I started in Mutson Microsystems, uh, and this was very early, around early 2000. So you, you kind of know how old I am. Um, and uh, basically, we're looking at Greek computing, uh, which you know has, has kind of evolved to cloud computing right now. So that was my kind of how I got started. And you know, from there, HPC, uh, I moved into uh, machine learning and deep learning as well. Okay, um, so for today, what I want to cover for the next maybe an hour and a half, or maybe um, you know, around an hour and a half is uh, really two technologies that IBM provides um, to help in accelerating uh, machine learning. So one is SnapML, and the other one is something we call H2O driverless AI. So SnapML is something, uh, it's free of touch, we don't charge for it. Um, it's a library that uh, I'll go into more detail. H2O Driver AI is a commercial product, but the nice thing about it is that uh, there is a way for you to test it uh, unlimited times, right? So I'll, I'll go through both technologies as well as how you can actually try out these technologies after the end of the talk. Um, I also provide you the code that I have, Jupyter Notebook, uh, the slides as well. We will provide you in, uh, you know, in a separate link. Uh, probably tomorrow I'll post it in your meetup group as well. Okay, let me share my screen right now. So it's going to be two parts, and the first part I'm going to talk about SnapML. Um, yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, these two technologies help to accelerate machine learning, uh, but they do it in very different ways, um, and that's something that's something I'll go a bit more into detail. 
So my LinkedIn profile is there. So if any of you want to, you know, uh, add me, please feel free to do so. It's always good to have uh, more contacts in the machine learning and deep learning community. Okay, let's get started. So this is going to be my uh, agenda for the first part of the talk today. And basically, introduction is more or less done. And I'm going to go into what exactly is this um, I I'm, I'm guessing most of you probably never heard of it. It's, uh, it's fairly new. So this was uh, you know, something that was developed by IBM um, Systems Group uh, quite, quite recently. Um, so so it's, it's something very interesting, if you, especially if you haven't heard about it. Um, and, and I would really love to hear your feedback at the end of the talk. You know, what, what do you think about it? So I'll talk about what is SPML and then how do you actually use it? I'll jump into the demo. So I have a demo running on my desktop right now. So later when I share my screen, you can see I'm actually having a Ubuntu uh, desktop. So SPML is optimized for, uh, it can run on, on Intel servers or on IBM servers as well. Uh, and we, we do some uh, optimizations for the IBM servers, but that doesn't mean you cannot run it on Intel server. And, and the reason for the demo is to show you that even on a desktop with a GTX GPU, you can still use it. Finally, we'll go into some use cases as well as some benchmarks uh, against the other machine learning algorithms out in the market. And then I'll leave you with some links uh, on how to try SPML for yourself as well after the end of this talk. So why, why the need for SPML or why did IBM come out with SNAPML? If you look at the usage of uh, you know, machine learning frameworks in the market, although this 2018, I have one that's a bit more updated later on, it's more or less the same. You can see that almost uh, based on the Sir Kaggle survey, almost half of them are uh, data scientists are still using psychic lens, right? Uh, and why? And the reason for that is quite straightforward, right? Um, although deep learning, of course, has really increased in popularity. If you look at your Kaggle competitions, you know, um, pretty much everyone, 99% of them are using XGBoost, uh, you know, in order to submit their problems, right? Um, so machine learning is still a very big part of um, AI, right? Deep learning, of course, catching up. And of course, there's a lot of variety of machine learning models um, and really depends on the kind of uh, data set and the kind of business problem that you're trying to solve. Different models work pretty well with uh, different, you know, uh, with different data sets. So, so there's a reason for, uh, you know, psychic learning being very popular, right? Almost everyone knows uh, how to use it as well. Uh, but of course, there's some downsides uh, because it's kind of focused on machine learning. Um, you know, it, of course, they don't provide deep learning libraries, but that's that's a easy problem to solve, right? Because all you know, you already have all these open source deep uh, learning libraries like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, or what have you. Um, so that, that's not a, that's not really a big problem. Secondly, um, if you guys have tried it with very last data sets, you'll realize the performance is actually not so great. Uh, it doesn't really work very well uh, when you have very big, big, uh, very big data sets. And that's kind of uh, where SNAML really fits in, uh, in terms of uh, why we, we kind of develop SNAML. Uh, we realized from talking to our customers, you know, who are still doing machine learning, especially in uh, financial industry, uh, where they need to explain the models, which is another good reason for using machine learning, that uh, when they try to run it on uh, big data sets, they, they do hit a bottleneck in terms of the performance and in terms of how long it takes to run. And that's basically uh, the kind of the drive for us to actually build uh, this solution called SNAML. So what exactly is SNAML? Uh, obviously, it stands for SNAP Machine Learning. And it's basically a library. It's a machine learning library that helps data scientists accelerate their machine learning algorithms. So, and I'll go into some of these algorithms that we help to accelerate. So we focus on a couple of things, uh, performance, right? So it's really fast. And the reason it's really fast is because we're actually leveraging on uh, GPUs. So of course, uh, most of you know for machine learning, uh, most of the time you don't use GPUs. Of course, uh, things like XGBoost do support GPUs. Um, you know, if you use CML or Rapid, right? Uh, but again, more, it's not that easy to configure um, and, and, and so forth, right? But most of the machine learning algorithms still run only on, G, on CPU. So, um, so that's what we, we did, first of all, is to kind of take this uh, typical classical machine learning algorithms and kind of try to accelerate it on GPUs. So we did a lot of code parallelization uh, in order to leverage on the GPU cost. Secondly, is we wanted to make sure that it's very scalable to very large data sets as well because that's where we see most of the problems that our clients have uh, with, with tools like Psychic Lens. Um, extremely high resource uh, uh, efficiency. What that means is that, um, so when we realize, okay, when you have very large data sets, you know, and if you're gonna use it on GPU, 
the GPU memory is very limited, right? You have 16 gigabytes. If you're using a consumer, it's 12 gigabytes. And if you're really rich, you've got 32 gigabytes, a V100, or of course, the 800 is coming up pretty soon. But other than that, you know, if you do big data sets um, using GPU, you tend to get out of memory errors. So we decided to do some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, work around, well, not really work around, some optimization around that. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. Finally, of course, um, machine learning, it's again very popular because you are able to actually interpret the, uh, the models, right? Especially with the, with the simpler models. Um, of course, with FGBoost and stuff, uh, ensemble, ensemble models a bit more difficult. But uh, you know, for most of the uh, logistic regression, linear regression, you can actually interpret it as well. So that's something that's also key in FSI and most other clients uh, where they need to interpret the models as well. So these are the kind of things that we actually focus as we develop SNAML. Uh, and, and, and I'll show you what's the result of it. So, um, so before, so what more algorithms do we um, typically support? So earlier you saw the survey for 2018, so I managed to pull out the 2019 survey. So even though it's 2019, you still see the classical machine learning algorithms being the most commonly used. So you can see the, the graph, it's a bit blur, sorry about that. Right, it's either linear or log logistic regression, you've got your decision trees, and then you have your GBMs, like your XGBoost, your CADBoost, and so forth. And then you've got your CNNs, your RNNs, and so forth, right? So what we did is really to focus on the most commonly used algorithms, right? And if you look at the left side, that's basically uh, where we provide acceleration for. So when you talk about general, uh, linear, generalized linear models or GLMs, we got a logistic regression, rich regression, lesser regression, SVMs, and so forth. For tree base, of course, we, we support decision trees and random forests. And then for gradient boosting machines, uh, we provide our own gradient boosting machine called IBM StatBoost. So this, this is what uh, we are currently working on. And we are also looking to, of course, add more support for other algorithms, again, based on customer feedback. Um, so, of course, IBM, you know, um, our development really, it's really kind of driven by our customers based on the, where the market is actually going, right? Because uh, there's no point for us to support an uh, algorithm that's not very commonly used uh, because then, then we, don't gonna have, we are not going to have a lot of people using it, right? So, so this is something that uh, we typically focus. We listen to our customers and then based on the feedback, we, we kind of decide where the, where the product should go. Um, so, so I covered this briefly earlier, but just to quickly explain why GLMs are useful. Uh, again, I would say the number one reason talking to uh, our customers, especially in FSI, it's really about the explainability or interpretability, right? Um, again, when you use complex models like your XGBoost or other uh, GBMs, right, then it becomes harder to explain. And this is a major problem uh, for financial industries for a couple of reasons, right? Uh, one is that basically for auditing purposes, right? If you're going to, for example, reject or accept a loan, uh, a loan application by someone, um, you know, you can just can't tell the person or you just can't, can't tell the bank manager that it is because the model said to reject, right? Uh, or the model thinks that he will default on his loan. Um, you know, the bank manager will come back and say, oh, look, I know this guy, you know, he's trustworthy, you know, so what, what you, you have to explain to me. So, so that's why we see a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, use for that. Uh, in terms of explaining the models, right? Of course, to get very good performance, you know, that's one step, but really to put models into production, that's something else altogether. The other reason where interpretability is very important is also for bias detection. So if you're really, if you've been in the machine learning space for a while, uh, you will know that that's something that's uh, being researched heavily right now, uh, because it's, again, uh, before you put something in production, where you're gonna make decisions that can affect human lives, right? Whether you're offering them a loan or not, or whether you are screening someone for a job, uh, a job application, uh, you know, application, whether they're suitable or not, you want to make sure there's no uh, bias there, all right? And th this is why explaining the models becomes very important. Um, some of you must have heard about the Amazon use case where when they applied machine learning to their, um, you know, for their HR practices, where they actually um, scan job uh, applica uh, applications and then kind of filter out uh, the good ones, or so called, at, at least based on the model. They later found out that there was a bias towards men, right? And again, it's always about bias data, right? Because previously, when um, you know, when someone is interviewing, they tend to be men, so a lot of them tend to prefer men over women, even though some the women might have a higher qualifications or even the same qualifications. So these are the kind of things that uh, you know that is kind of stopping um, AI or machine learning from being deployed into production in a lot of organizations. So and I you know so. So that's the reason why this is pretty important. 
And of course, the basic uh, models, the simpler models are then uh, used for, uh, you know, uh, more complicated models or what we call ensemble models, right? So uh, most of your gradient boosting machines uh, models use decision trees, right? Um, so this is, by so if you accelerate the simpler models, you also accelerate the, um, the, the, the GBMs as well. Uh, finally, that because they are typically linear, the simpler models, they, they are less complex and they're easier to tune as well. So I was talking about snap boost earlier. So, um, you know, some of you might ask the question, okay, why do you need to create another GBM, right? Since there's already so many GBMs, there's light GBM, there's XG boost, there's cat boost and so forth. Um, so again, we want to do something different, right? There's no point uh, coming out with something that everybody, you know, that's similar to uh, what is in the market. So uh, we do a bit different here with our uh, snap boost, um, you know, uh, boosting machine. So where, if you look at the chart, it's, it's kind of pretty clear uh, what's the difference. So typically, when you look at GBMs, they, they learn a sequence of homogeneous trees, right? They use, uh, typically the tree depth for them are all the same. So for us, uh, we are trying to be a bit more flex flexible. So really based on the features, uh, you know, at, at, at each step, then we, or each iteration, we kind of uh, actually um, kind of um, configure the tree depth to be dynamic. So, so with this, we realized we got some good results and I'll share some of the results later as well. So that's a very quick um, overview of um, SNAPML and also SNAP Boost. So let me now uh, explain to you how, how you can actually use this in your machine learning code. So before that, you know, just to explain, of course, uh, you know, just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. SNAPML, just like uh, your XGBoost and um, your linear regression models, basically work with tabular data. You got your target, you know, you got your target column, right, or your target feature. So basically, anything that's tabular, it's focused on that. Sorry about that. Um, one interesting thing that uh, that that we did optimization for SNAPML is that um, the data set can be dense or sparse. Okay, so for those who um, you know might not be familiar, sparse data sets means uh, data sets with a lot of zeros. So sometimes you look at your, for example, sensor data, um, they, you know, they, they might have this kind of uh, uh, data where there's a lot of the columns are actually zeros. So uh, one thing we notice is um, psychic learn doesn't really work, um, doesn't really perform very well with sparse data. So that's something as well that we did quite a bit of uh, optimizations there. And uh, again, I'll show you some benchmarks to kind of um, show you the difference in terms of the performance as well. So here's a typical tabular uh, data set. Right, uh, it's a credit default, and this one I'm going to demo later as well um, during the uh, the live demo that's going to come up in a bit. So, how do you actually use um, Sy um, SnapML? Right, uh, the answer is it's really really easy to use. So, uh, I would say most of you should know uh, this code pretty well, right? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have used Jupyter notebooks and Scikit-Learn. So this is how you typically do a logistic regression, right? Um, very straightforward and, you know, and yeah, so very straightforward, right? So you can see that in this case, the logistic regression uh, model took around 80 seconds for the data set and accuracy was 0 0.959, right? Um, so in this case, you're using accuracy, of course, you can always change it to F1 or precision or whatever they want. And how do you run that same code on SNAPML? Um, so it's as simple as just changing two lines of code, which you can see right at the top. So all you have to do, and later again, I'll show you the live demo and how exactly this is done, but it's really that simple. You just have to import um, the SNAPML li library is called PAI for SK, right? Or uh, the full name is Power AI for Psychic Learn. And that's it, right? The rest of it, import logistic regression. And then of course, since we are using GPUs here, um, you've got to add another line to, uh, to kind of mention that. It doesn't mean that SnapML can only use GPUs and it cannot use CPUs. So that's why uh, you can also use CPUs and you are still going to get a, a decent performance benefit even when you're using CPUs. But of course, with GPUs, you're going to get much more. And then followed by the device IDs. The device IDs are your GPU, you know, your, uh, your GPU. So in this case, if I have a four GPUs, then a GPU ID is 0, 1, 2, 3. And later I'll show you how you can see, right? Basically you do an NVIDIA SMI for that. Uh, the threads here are basically the number of threads for your GPU cores, right? So typically, um, you know, depending on how many cores your GPU has, right? Um, you, can, you can kind of tweak this and you can change the number and see how the performance is. The rest of the code is pretty much, uh, pretty much the same as you can see. 
And basically based on this, you can see the difference here. Let me just go back one. So it was, it was 80 seconds on uh, using Psychic Learn, and it was literally, so it was less than two seconds on um, SnapML, right? Uh, just by changing two lines of code. And we look at accuracy, it's more or less uh, the same, right? 9.983, 9.983. So the speed up here is uh, close to 50 times. A caveat here, the, the difference is much bigger as you, uh, uh, if your data set is bigger. So with very small data sets, you will see uh, less, uh, less of a difference. It's still quite decent. So for the demo later that I'm gonna show you, um, I'm usually using a fairly small data set because when I tried to run the, the big data set, my desktop crashed because I only have a 12 gig of memory. So during the pre-processing, uh, because the data set was so big, my, my desktop actually crashed. So I had to kind of uh, bring it down, right? But if, yeah, but, but um, otherwise, you know, so for big data sets, you're gonna see a much bigger difference. The other thing that uh, we are also working on, uh, this is a work in progress. It's also to provide, as I mentioned, because of the fact that uh, people, uh, and I say, especially in the FSI industry, people want to explain the models. So uh, we also added that kind of, that functionality here. So here you can see under the code model analysis, uh, we have a, a support function, and by using the support function, we can actually um, uh, uh, get SNML to tell you what features in your data set was the most important uh, factors. Of course, it's fairly basic, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's, but uh, this, like I said, this is a work progress, and we are adding more functionality, in it, uh, you know, maybe to, to rank the, 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 the importance of the factors and so forth. So that's something we're working on, uh, working on at a, at a moment. Okay, so that's kind of very quickly um, how, how we actually, um, you know, use SnapML. So let me show you a live demo, right? The proof is in the pudding. And I want to show you that, I also want to prove to you that you can actually do this on your own machine as well. So let me just um, switch to my demo here. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so I hope you guys can see my demo here, all right? So this is my Jupyter Notebook. So you can see this is actually running on my um, desktop at home. It's an Ubuntu desktop, right? Um, so it's actually a Docker container. So I'll show you how to actually, um, you know, run this later on your own as well. Okay, so you can see that my desktop, this is my desktop. It's a um, you know, it's, it's just a D GTX um, 1070, right? Uh, this is, I think it's almost four years old. So at the time it was considered a really good GP, of course now, you know, I think it's still decent, but you know, it's of course, uh, now you have much better GPUs here. Um, eight, um, you know, eight gig of memory and so forth. So, okay, so let's look at the use case here. And so what's the use case here is, uh, and I covered it briefly during a slide. It's basically looking at credit risk analysis or basically trying to figure out uh, whether a customer will default on the loan, right? Um, so to, I want to know the probability um, or I want to predict whether this customer is going to default on the loan and based on that prediction, I want to decide whether I want to give him a loan or not. Um, there are two ways to actually um, implement this, right? And I put these two ways and, um, you know, so it's fairly straightforward. Again, most of you, uh, I would think most data scientists would either be familiar with Conda or familiar with uh, Docker, right? So we have both options. Uh, if you're using Conda, we actually have our own Conda channel. So I'm just highlighting this for you. So all you have to do is basically, um, and this, this is on my GitHub as well. So later I'll, I'll give you the GitHub page as well. So you can download the code. And I'm also gonna send you the, um, the, the this Jupyter Notebook in a, in a separate, uh, at a meetup tomorrow as well. Uh, I'll put the link there as well. So, um, so we put SpamML into this Conda repository here. So all you need to do, of course, just create a Conda environment, um, you know, uh, and I'll talk more about this. You need CUDA version 10.2, and then you just install these few libraries, right? PI4SK, which is your SnapML library, Psychic Learn, Seaborn for your um, visualization, and of course, uh, Jupyter Notebook as well, and then you're pretty much good to go. Um, if you're running on IBM server, we, we also provide the XG boost that uses GPU as well, but uh, for x86 for Intel, we don't have that. So that's one way if you're familiar with Conda environments. Um, the only caveat here is sometimes when, um, you know, there is, I do run into conflicts with my, um, with my base environment. 
Um, so sometimes, especially if you upgrade your CUDA, you, you see some issues there and sometimes it fails to detect the GPU. Uh, the other way, uh, which I would say is a much, much simpler way is actually to use Docker containers. And again, we do have our own Docker repository as well. So all you need to do is just run this command uh, and it automatically download the container for you. And then you just go into the container and then um, again, just install the, these few packages. And then this is how you actually run it. So this is what I actually did for today. I have a, a Docker container here just to show you in a, um, in a bit. And then I start up Jupyter and then just go to the URL uh, on my homepage. Okay, so just to show you, the, this is a Docker container here, right? Um, okay, so that's kind of uh, how you get started. Okay, let's go into the actual code. So again, the focus of this presentation is really to uh, show you the difference between psychic land and spam L. So some of the things I probably won't run too much. So here is just uh, how you download the data set. So as I mentioned, for, for the purposes of this demo, I used a smaller one, uh, which is around 100 uh, megabytes, right? Uh, but if you have a better server with a lot of memory, then you can go for this. It's, a, it's around slightly more than one gigabyte. Um, but like I said, uh, when I tried this, it crashed, so, so I wouldn't advise against it. I mean, I wouldn't advise uh, doing that. So I just click this and you'll check. So I just added this extra bit of code. If the file is there, then do not download it again so that it doesn't download it again and again. All right, this is, next part is probably the most important part and also the reason why, um, unfortunately, you cannot run this on Google Collab, uh, which I really want, I was hoping that I could do that so that, because that's, I'm very sure pretty much every data scientist, uh, you know, uh, uses Google Collab for all this kind of simple tests. And the reason is, uh, it's not because of IBF, uh, in this case, I have to blame Google, okay, just kidding. Um, we need driver version 40, 440, right, um, and CUDA, because the CUDA 10.2 does rely on driver version 440. And unfortunately, Google Collab, uh, they haven't upgraded it yet, because this is really done on the, on the system level. So Google Collab, the last time I checked, which was a month ago, is still using 418. And that's the reason why uh, you can't run it. Uh, I've been trying to check um, quite um, religiously every few months, every, every month, uh, to see whether they've upgraded it. So once they upgrade it, then I'm probably going to create a little demo on uh, Google Collab um, so that anybody can just, you know, kind of speed up and start using it as well. But for, for now, unfortunately, um, you cannot run it on Google Collab. Okay, so just to run it, right, so you can see it's uh, G GTX 1070 and so forth. So, um, and so uh, after this demo, you can see that okay, it runs on x86, uh, but there's a reason, like say, of course, being IBM, we did some optimizations for our IBM server. So as you might or might not know, we provide our own servers with our own CPU. And uh, what, what we did is that uh, we have some very unique capabilities in the server. Uh, and that's something Michael, my colleague, will co cover later as well. And we do, we do make use of those optimizations. And uh, I'll show you some benchmarks as well. But that doesn't mean you cannot run it on x86, right? You just won't get the same performance. All right, the rest is fairly straightforward. Um, just kind of, uh, you know, the typical uh, importing all your libraries, right? So I'm going to forward some of this, um, you know, stuff, right? All right, so this is basically, uh, you have uh, around a million, of, million rows and 19 variables, right? Um, so again, I'm trying to detect uh, is default, right? So this is my target column. I want to detect that, right? And these are all the other um, information that I have, credit history, um, you know, whether it's his own car, whether it's owns his own property, uh, yada, yada, right? Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, then just some visualization. Um, in this case, it's really looking at distribution of is default. So um, this is again, um, you know, I think it's a Kaggle data set. Typically, uh, so you're looking at around 20% that defaulted, around 80% that did not. Other things, uh, again, I don't run too much into it. Again, I can provide you code, and I think most of you who are using Jupyter Notebooks uh, would be very familiar with uh, visualization, uh, with all this type of visualization as well, right? So this is the pretty straightforward stuff. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, drill down to the, to the main part, which is really the machine learning training part, right? Okay, so here I'm splitting the um, data, doing some data transformation, some normalization, 
All right, very standard stuff, right? Uh, you, you pretty much do it for every, you know, uh, every machine learning problem here. Uh, okay, so now we get to the good, the interesting part. So here's where we're doing the split, right? Splitting between test and train. And here is where we start doing the training. So first I'm gonna train the logistic regression here. Okay, so this is the code that you saw earlier. Um, again, nothing nothing difficult, right? Pretty much anyone who has done logistic regression uh, uh, should know this code pretty well. So let me run this. And again, this data set is small, so that's the caveat. Uh, for the bigger data set, I think it takes almost, uh, well, still not too bad, it takes around two minutes plus, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but in this case, because it's just a fraction of it, if I'm, it should take around 10, 15 seconds. Okay, 15 seconds, accuracy score, uh, accuracy score of 97%, uh, 97%. So now let's go into the step ML code, right? So looking at the code again, um, again from the slide and it's here, just to emphasize here, all you literally need to do is just change uh, these two lines of code, right? So this from, sorry, just from this two, change it to this two. Okay, um, the Star ML, uh, it, it scales up to two GPUs. So if you actually have two GPUs, some of you guys might have desktop with two RTX, if you don't have servers, um, you can actually do that as well, right? Um, you can use two GPUs. Uh, if you want to run more than two GPUs, basically we have to pay, right? So, we, so this uh, the free version is limited to two GPUs uh, at any uh, maximum of two GPUs, right? But again, uh, you know, that's really unless you're talking about massive data sets, uh, you probably wouldn't need to to scale beyond two GPUs. So you can see the the parameters are fairly straightforward. Use GPU true. Device ID is zero. So where do you get device ID? Just in case you're not too sure, it's just um, NVIDIA SMI, right? This is your device ID, okay? So it should be zero if you have uh, one, but it's always good to double check, um, you know? So if you have two GPUs, there will be zero and one. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so. All right, next. Um, yeah, so next part here is that, um, so we're gonna train it right now. So let's do a train. And you can see that it, it, uh, it didn't even take one second. It was 0.93 seconds. Accuracy is uh, 97.00002. So slightly less than this, but uh, pretty much almost, uh, you know, it's almost the same. Um, logistic regression, um, the speed up was 15, 15 times. Okay, so you can see that uh, just by changing two lines of code, you can see a huge a uh, huge difference in terms of the speed up, right? So it's not that difficult to use this. Um, of course, the other library that provides similar functionality is Rapid. Uh, but even my, with my own uh, use of Rapid, or when I try it, it's not as simple, right? You still need to, uh, it's not as straightforward as this. So next, uh, Random Forest. So let's look at uh, training the same model with Random Forest here. So I ran it earlier, it took 25 seconds. Uh, let's see how long it takes. So again, very straightforward. Um, again, if you're doing, doing random forest models, this again is very familiar to you. So, so again, StatML is, like I say, just a library for you to use, right? Um, um, and, and it's quite straightforward. For those who maybe um, are looking for something a bit simpler to use, then that's really the H2O driverless, uh, driverless AI. So that's really an auto ML solution that um, IBM kind of resells. So it's not our product uh, because what IBM does is that basically we do look for the best of breed solutions in the market and where we see that the, the solution is really mature and you know really advanced, we kind of uh, partner with them to, to sell the solution, right? Um, there's no point, nobody can be the best at everything. So I think that's, so that's, that's the reason why we, uh, we work with H2O. So here you got 30 seconds with 98% uh, um, accuracy, right? And then let's try running it with SNAML. All right, so running SNAML, it's around uh, eight seconds, around four X speed up. So with the larger data set, we are looking at close to, um, I think it's slightly more, around 15 times speed up with the larger data set. 
Then finally, uh, I want to just show you the Snap Boost, right, which is the GPM that I talked about, talked about earlier that's developed by IBM. So again, very straightforward, just have to import boosting machine. Um, and then there's some basically uh, parameters here. So it can actually be used for either classification or regression, right? Um, it doesn't matter. So I just put a use GPU through. Right now it only works with one GPU, right? And after running that, you can see that it's literally um, 1.3 seconds. Um, and unfortunately the accuracy is lower. So again, it really depends on the data sets and later I'll show you some examples where step boost has much, much better accuracy. Um, you know, so it really depends on the data set. Some data sets really uh, work in, especially as I mentioned, if you have more sparse data sets, um, then you're gonna see a much better accuracy because, uh, because of the fact that we did some optimizations there. So we're looking at around 23X speed up here, all right, uh, compared to psychic land, um, um, random forest. Um, the last one, I can't run it here. So this is run, um, so as I mentioned, we also uh, provide XG Boost as well, the GPU version, uh, but this we only uh, support on IBM servers as well, right? So, so, it's, so basically, we can't do this, but uh, this is available if you run, if you use an IBM server. Okay, so that was my uh, demo, very quick demo, right, just to show you how it works. Okay, so let's look at some benchmarks and some use cases uh, that I, I would think is a really good candidate to use that ML. Um, so I would say the most um, obvious use case would be really um, financial services because of the fact that they typically have very, very huge data sets. Um, so in this case, let's look at this example, credit default. So the opportunity to use machine learning, uh, especially something like ML is pretty big here, right? Uh, where they want to um, kind of uh, assess the client's credit risk so that they can kind of adjust their offer to kind of mitigate that risk. So here we can see uh, this using a Kaggle data set um, and it's a credit default with 10 million um, rows, for example, and 18 features. So uh, looking at the benchmark here for Psychic Line, it took around 76 seconds. For SnapML, it took uh, 4.8 seconds. And this is using an older GPU. It's a P100 rather than a V100. The other one that we see, especially more so, I would say, is actually financial fraud. Uh, the reason for that is really because fraud is such a you know a, a big issue. Um, whenever fraud happens and whenever you need to retrain the model, you don't want to take a long time to retrain, right? Because the the volume data volume is extremely large, and the velocity very large as well, right? You have transactions coming in like pretty much uh, every every second or less than, less than a second. So whenever fraud is detected, uh, you know, and it's missed, especially by the model, you need to quickly retrain it as well. And again, you know, this again, this is the reason why um, speed is very paramount here. And again, you can see that we have a, around six times faster speed up, and this is just with 285,000 examples, right? Um, of course, in real life, you're gonna have probably millions of examples, um, uh, and also and with 31 features here. Um, the interesting thing was this was not even using a GPU. So as I mentioned, SnapML does provide optimizations for CPU only. Um, so even without using a GPU, we got around, uh, you know, we got a pretty decent speed up here. Uh, going a bit more detail here. Um, so how about comparing it to other GBMs, right? So just, uh, just to show you. So, so this, we are right now in our second iteration of SnapML. First one, our score is 0.1, now 0.2. Uh, and what you can see here based on this, uh, with the exact same data set from previously. So again, looking at 285,000 rows, 31 uh, columns of features. Uh, we actually got the best accuracy uh, compared to XGBoost, like GBM, CatBoost as well, right? And, uh, and our runtime was also pretty, uh, you know, it was not the lowest, but it was uh, between XGBoost and like GBM, right? Which you can see uh, on the left chart. Right, so on the left side, you can see it's, it, uh, like GBM was the lowest, uh, we were the second lowest, and then XGBoost was the uh, third lowest. But in terms of uh, test loss, we actually got the uh, lowest here. Um, we also did other benchmarks here with OpenML, for example. So OpenML has some benchmarks uh, that they typically provide for benchmarking. Uh, and of course, after tuning, we, we have to do a bit of tuning here for all the models, not just, uh, not out of the box. 
So and what 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 happened here is that we got the best um, the best score. Uh, lower means better here for almost all except two of the data sets. Okay, so again, I would say you know, it, it shows that uh, you know that this is a pretty powerful library. Okay, so average test loss, um, yeah, it's um, you know uh, we, we, it's really good performance here, right? So we only lost uh, in two. One was the, um, the seven Elrond's uh, data set, and the other is the phishing websites, right? And that one, I think both became in second. Another use case would, uh, something that we also tested this on was on product price suggestion, right? So this is basically a use case where, um, this was a challenge created by a shopping app in Japan called Makari. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And they wanted to offer pricing suggestions to sellers, right? Uh, based on seasonal trends, based on brand names, uh, based on the product specs and so forth. So you're looking at 1.5 million rows, uh, observations or examples, and 98 features, right? Including name, item, description, item condition, brand name, category, and so forth. And um, you know, so, and again, you can see here that uh, Snap Boost again got the best accuracy here. Um, um, you know, the latest one. So again, we're doing a lot of improvements and enhancements to this solution. And also in terms of runtime, again, we are somewhere in the middle. Uh, like GBM is against the, the, the fastest, um, and but we are still faster than XGPUs. Store sales forecasting is another one, right? Uh, again, uh, this one, we, we got the, again, yeah, we got the press accuracy and uh, again, like GBM is the fastest and we are second. Oh, well, sorry, in this case, we are, yeah, we are second. So you can see again um, that this library, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty good, right? Uh, even though it's, it, like I say, it's a fairly recent library, definitely much newer than uh, XGBoost and like, uh, like GBM, um, you know, we are getting pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good results. We also tested against H2O. So for those who, I'm gonna cover H2O in a bit, uh, but we are talking about the H2O open source. So, uh, and I'll cover this later as I mentioned, H2O has both a commercial version and open source libraries as well. Uh, and we worked with a financial customer here where they, they actually kind of uh, used uh, one of the open source GBM models from H2O. And then when they tried it with Snapboost, um, we got 12% better accuracy. Uh, runtime was almost the same, 21 minutes to 20 minutes. Right, both of them using the same, exact same hardware as well. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier as well, there's another technology that's also used by uh, you know, people which is uh, to, to accelerate machine learning for GPUs, and that's basically uh, CML or RAPIDS, right? So for RAPIDS, a um, couple of things, they only support a single GPU, and they run out of memory, um, they cannot handle big data sets. So if you have very big data sets, if you have tried this uh, with Rapids, you'll realize that uh, beyond a certain size, it starts failing, right? And basically, you know, so, and that's something that we don't have, right? Uh, because we have something called, we scale out of core. What that means is that um, if the data set is too big for the GPU, we actually do some uh, swapping between the system memory and the GPU memory. So this is handled by the um, CML library as well. So here you can see, um, so what, is, what this chart is actually showing you is that as the number of examples, the number of rows increase, and the number of features as well. So if you look at it, the uh, number of features, if it's 10,000, then the speed up of CML versus Rapids is uh, close to seven to eight times, right? So that's just telling you uh, the sweet spot for CML, right, where you have a very, um, many, much, much more features um, and, and very much more uh, rows or observations or examples, you're gonna see a very big speed up. This is another one, uh, one of the earlier ones that we actually did, right? Uh, this is actually a, a data set for click, uh, click through. So it's, a, it's called Crito. And it has 200 million training examples and 1 million features. So it's a massive data set. Uh, you can see that and this is just testing both on STEML for both x86 and power. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, on our own IBM systems, we do provide some optimizations. One of the optimizations is NVLink. Of course, you might say, hey, look, x86 also has an NVLink. You are right. But uh, we are the only system in the market that has NVLink between the CPU and GPU right now. 
right? Uh, most people have NVLink, uh, most systems, or all, all other systems have NVLink between the GPUs, but not between the CPU and GPU. And that's the reason why I mentioned the out of core performance. We can do this swapping between the CPU and GPU and system memory because of that NVLink as well. So, so the, the transfer of data, especially for big data sets, uh, no longer becomes a bottleneck. Okay, so in summary, um, you know, so what's the difference between StarML, between Rapids, and between Psychic Learn? Um, so this is a benchmark of different uh, models, right? Uh, and you can click the link after, I'll provide, again, I'll provide you this data, um, this slides as well. So as I mentioned, where you see the best performance, right, if your data is very sparse and has a lot of features, uh, that's where you're gonna see a huge performance. So if you look at the top right chart there, um, on the top right, the green box, you can see that uh, the price prediction data set, uh, again, the link uh, tells you more about the data set, gives you a huge performance. We are looking at anything from 70% to close to 300% performance. The worst will be uh, very dense data and very few features. So if you look at the Higgs data set here, um, we are actually, uh, most of the time, we are actually slower or just a very slight increase. So what this this is just basically tell you where again right there's no one size one size fit all there's no machine learning library that's good for everything um, but uh, basically based on our, our own results we we kind of uh, have come to the conclusion that Snell does perform better with CML for you know uh, where where it meets this uh, kind of uh, description right where the data set is extremely feature rich have a lot of features and also when the uh, data set is very sparse and also. So that's basically where you see the biggest improvement. Of course, for this psychic lens, um, it's a no contest, right? So you can see here at the bottom right, uh, you're getting anything from 80, 80x to 30, 37x speed up. So who would benefit from this, right? Uh, it would be data scientists who are using machine learning algorithms, right? Uh, who use psychic lens very, you know, very often, who work with very large data sets or sparse data sets, and who want to speed up machine learning but don't want to make two changes to their psychic learn code. I think this is going to be my last slide for the first part of the presentation. So it's just a summary slide here. So SPML, uh, as I mentioned earlier, fast, scalable, resource efficient, and interpretable. Uses GPU for acceleration, can actually run on multiple nodes. Um, that's the commercial version. Uh, the free version is only limited to two GPUs on a single node and also leverages uh, NVLink for out of core performance on the power systems. So very good for financial uh, services um, type of use cases. Okay, so I covered this briefly during the demo, but just to show you uh, how you're gonna use it. So as I mentioned, there is uh, both a uh, Conda environment and this is the Conda environment that you can use. Or there's um, an easier way if you have a Docker env uh, environment, right? Uh, for Ubuntu, of course, you need NV Docker. Then you just pull the Docker container. I would say that's probably the easier way to do it. And you don't have to worry about conflicts and stuff like that. Uh, the notebook um, that I just demoed earlier is also uploaded on my GitHub. Um, apologies in advance, it's a bit messy. I'm supposed to do some cleanup. But uh, if you go there, you can see there's a notebook called Latest, and that's basically what I used to demo today. So that's something you can try out as well. Uh, there's documentation of SPML uh, is there as well, and a couple of um, links for you to check out for benchmarks and so forth. All right, uh, that was the end of my presentation. Um, so I'll probably stop here for questions. I just realized that I. I don't know whether could, could you see my console earlier because I, I think I just showed, uh, I'm not too sure. But anyway, I'll stop here for questions. Um, are there any questions uh, from the from anyone online? No? I think there are no questions yet. Ralph, anything from you? Yeah, no questions yet. Okay. All right, so if that's the case, then I'll move on to the second part of the presentation. Go back. Okay. All right. So the second part is uh, is where I'm going to talk about H two O. Okay. So H two O. Um, 
it's a uh, basically a company that that basically provides uh, oops it's auto moving uh, auto ml solution okay they're quite well known in the market um, they have both open source and a commercial um, version so a lot of people are using the open source uh, uh, libraries so just to show you the difference here so the open source version um, is basically just libraries that they provide so very similar to StarML, they provide some libraries um, they provide some of the libraries are GPU accelerated but not all uh, it's completely open source um, and basically just like uh, StarML, data scientists it's more for data scientists uh, they do provide their own notebook interface called H2O flow right and they provide uh, enterprise support for it but today what we're going to talk about is really uh, auto ML solution called driverless AI uh, this is really for enterprises it's built for both data scientists as well as uh, non-data scientists, right? Or domain users or data analysts. So of course, uh, you know, uh, most of the organization, they have some sort of data analysts, right? They're engineers, because most of them have a data warehouse or they have a BI solution, uh, but they might not be very familiar with machine learning, right? So uh, this, this product really kind of uh, helps them to kind of address that gap. But it also helps data scientists as well. And I'll give you some use cases there. Uh, and what they're trying to do, as I mentioned, is automated machine learning. Uh, it's fully automated from ingestion to deployment. They license basically per user, but it is free for educational use. So later, my colleague Michael will say, uh, we do provide this um, with the educational license to our customers as well, with, uh, with our server as well, and also provide uh, free training right, for those who are interested. So uh, that's something he, he will cover a bit more later as well. So, um, won a lot of awards, um, and if you look at the Gartner, uh, the Forrester report, that I think this was from last year, um, they are one of the top two auto ML solutions. Um, the other one is called Data Robot, which is also quite commonly known. Um, Data Robot, do not, um, well, there are some differences, right, uh, and probably that's beyond the scope of this presentation. So what's the reason for uh, the use of H2O DAI or driverless AI? Uh, it's basically they, they saw some issues in the market and it's basically kind of boiled down to this three. One is that um, especially when you want to create production ready models, you need um, really high quality data scientists, right? Because if you're going to put something, uh, a bank is going to put something into production, they need very high quality data scientists. And right now it's very difficult to get very high quality data scientists, right? I mean, of course, there's a lot of citizen data scientists. I'm a, I myself, I would barely consider myself a citizen and data scientist. But you know, when you're talking about production rather than just experimentation, that's just something else altogether. So it's difficult to get the talent in order to build a very good model, right? Someone who understands feature engineering as well as the domain expertise as well, right? That's really difficult. Secondly, it takes uh, weeks to months for data scientists to build a model, right? You have to try different models, uh, different parameters and so forth. And the biggest issue is probably the lack of trust. I covered this earlier, right? Um, the fact that some, if they use two complex models to get better performance, then they lose the ability to um, to kind of um, explain the models. And that's, that becomes a, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a really bottleneck for a lot of organizations to deploy this into their production systems because they, need, they, are, they do need to explain the models, of course. Uh, Singapore, for example, just taking Singapore example where I live, um, MES recently came out with, um, with a guideline on model explainability, uh, especially uh, fairness and bias detection. In Europe, they, they, I think they already enforced that. In US as well, I think they enforced it. In Asia, I think it's slowly going to be the, the, the it's going to be the norm very soon as well, right? Because otherwise, you know, it becomes a big problem. So why uh, use H2O? So it's basically, I like to call H2O a data scientist in a box. Um, so instead of, you know, trying to find this really, really top quality data scientist, um, and then, you know, uh, paying him lots of money and, you know, giving him a year or two years to build a model before it's in production, um, you get this software that kind of, it's a data scientist in a box, right? Doesn't mean it completely replace, and I'll explain why later as well, right? But it basically allows you to kind of reduce the amount of time uh, and also to automate some of the data scientists. So, and I'll give you some use cases later as well. And also in terms of time to train the models, um, again, we, we provide our own server. And again, this will be uh, mentioned by Michael later. 
uh, we leverage GPUs as well. And finally, it is about to explain the model. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you during the demo how it does that. So these are some of the key features. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the demo later because I think it's more interesting when you show a demo. So it does a bit of um, you know, uh, visualization where it can show you certain things like outliers, um, you know, correlation graphs, right? So, you know, of course, it's always the, you know, the mantra is garbage in, garbage out, right? If you put very bad data with errors into the, into the model, you're gonna get a crap model, right? Um, so this basically helps you to identify outliers and missing values. It actually handles them as well. Um, so if they're missing values, doesn't mean that you have to fill it in. Um, H2 can try and handle it for you. Um, that's something we can also do, right? So that's again the whole point of auto ML is to kind of reduce all this manual work that the data scientists have to do. Um, and then of course for the training, uh, it does automatic feature engineering um, in order to increase accuracy. So it's gonna try to create a lot of new features and I'll show you during the demo uh, how it does that as well. So it uses a variety of different transformers and so forth. Um, the one good thing about this is that it's not a black box. Uh, what do I mean? If you have your own more, your own algorithms that you want to use, and of course everyone knows there's all these new algorithms coming out on the market, um, they actually allow you to import algorithms, um, you know, uh, from externally as well. Now I'll show you during a demo how that's done, and now of course the tuning as well, um, trying to you know basic tuning to make sure that they can find the best uh, ensemble model for you. Explain the models, right? So they, they, there's a couple of ways they do that. They use some of uh, what we call surrogate models, which are simpler models, like K-line, your line, uh, line and so forth, in order to explain, that, uh, explain the model. So this is where it becomes very useful to explain to your line of business. It also automatically generates the documentation for you uh, so that you can at least have an audit of the model. So when you deploy, when something goes wrong, you can always have this uh, document with everything that was configured within the model what uh, algorithms was used, you know, what parameters was uh, tuned and so forth. Finally, and I think this is a very cool feature, it's uh, basically in terms of deployment of the models, uh, typically most of the solutions in the market, uh, it's server-based, you have to use a REST API, that means the models reside on the server, it cannot be exported. With H2, you can export it, there is no, uh, there's no dependency for you to leave it on the server. So in this case, you can export it in Python or Java, because some of the older systems where you might want to put it near, the, near where the data is, they might be running um, older, you know, not really the old, older versions of maybe AIX or Unix systems, then you can actually use Java to actually run it, right? And it's very fast, it doesn't need GPUs for the, uh, for the scoring. Okay, let's look at uh, kind of the interface uh, before I jump into the demo. So this is a typical machine learning pipeline, right? Again, most of you uh, who do data science are familiar with this. So you have your data integration where you are typically putting, you know, uh, you have to kind of consolidate your data together and then you do some transformation, uh, then you do your modeling, um, you know, do your feature engineering and so forth, feature selection, and then you tune your model, you build your model, and then it's an iterative process and then finally you have your final model. So DAI or driverless AI kind of handles, um, it doesn't do the data integration for you. So you still need to provide it one, CS, one, one source of data, one CSC file, for example, right? But it does help you partially, as I mentioned, it does help handle missing values, outliers and so forth, right? But the rest of it is all handled fully by uh, driverless AI. Uh, it is, like I said, based, um, you know, using some open source algorithms. So it does use scikit-learn, like GBM, XGBoost and so forth. Um, it also uses some proprietary uh, models as well. So what H2O does is um, they hire all the best Kaggle grandmasters. So they typically uh, kind of monitor the Kaggle competitions and then they see if they see someone who's uh, one of the top, uh, who's consistently top uh, in specific fields, all right, then, um, then they kind of uh, hire him. So in Singapore, we actually have one uh, Kaggle grandmaster who is actually um, an expert on NLP, and you know, so he, he so he, he's uh, he's part of the H2O team as well. How does it work? Um, and this is what I'm going to demo to you in a bit. So uh, very straightforward. You you can ingest your data in many ways, right? It can be a, a local file, HDFS, um, uh, object storage, whatsoever. Then you just look at some sorry some visualization. You, split, you do a data split, you do the visualization to look for outliers and so forth. 
um, and then you just click a button to train. Uh, and like I mentioned, you can use your own scorers, your own algorithms, your own transformations, transformers as well. And I'll show you how you can do that. After a while, you get the automatic scoring pipeline, and then you can uh, use it to look at the interpretability of it, right? You can look at the line charts and all that stuff. And again, I'll show you that, and finally deploy the, the model. All right, um, let's show you the example that I'm gonna demo in a bit. It's a credit card example as well. Uh, and what we're gonna do here is that based on the past behavior, can we predict if they are default on a credit card payment? So credit card payments, you know, uh, every month you have, um, you know, you have to pay, right? So, so they have the records of who pays or who missed the payment and so forth. And also using that, right, uh, maybe you want to also uh, predict whether they, they can fully pay off the loan as well, right, based on the behavior. So the answer is from Kaggle, right? So you can get it yourself. Um, it's, you know, they, um, you know, so they give you all the information. And again, you can see the data set in a bit. So we did a split between a train and test and then try to predict whether they were default. Uh, just to show you what this data set is. So as some, uh, the columns are ID, uh, the amount of balance, um, you know, for the credit card, uh, sex, education, whether they're married, what's their age, uh, whether they paid or not, right? Um, so for, for in this from August to April of 2005, uh, how much was their bill, credit card bill, and how much uh, did they pay previously, right? So in the previous month. So the one to six uh, is referring to the six months from August to April, and then whether they defaulted. Okay, so let me jump to the um, kind of, uh, you know, to the demo, so that at least actually it's, let me exit here. Okay, so for the demo, and later I'll show you uh, how to do this as well, right? Um, so H2, like I said, they're really nice. Um, they actually provide a free environment for anyone to try this out, okay? So um, basically, you just have to go to aquarium.h2.ai, register, and then go to Browse Labs and look for Lab 4. Right, and what happens, you just click start and then they give you a two hour instance. So mine, I have 42 minutes left, right? So I'll get right onto it. Uh, but yeah, it's very straightforward. And then you log in with training, training, and it's very nice because they give you some use cases all pre-built. Okay, let's look at this. So I already logged in into it as well. Let me close this. All right, so, um, so you can see a lot of different use cases here, uh, sentiment analysis, um, you know, even um, fake news, they're detecting hate fake news, uh, credit card, which is what I'm going to go through in a bit, um, even other things as well. The other thing that's uh, pretty interesting, I would say to me at least, is uh, uh, customer churning. So there is a telco customer churning. I think it's the last one. Let me look at it. Um, no, it's not this one. Yeah, here you go. Churning is a good use case, um, you know. Hmm. So, yeah, but I think for yeah for today, I'll probably just stick to the credit card since that's what my slide is. Okay, so let's look at the credit card uh, use case, right? So I've already done the split between uh, test and train. How do you split? It's very straightforward. You can see, you just click on it. You see a split, right? And then you have this, you put your uh, name of your test and your train here, or train and test, doesn't matter, your target column. You select a target color, in this case, I'm using default. Um, and then random seed is if you want to replicate the experiment, right? Um, then you remember this number so that every time it splits it the right way. And then here you just uh, put 0 0.8 and it splits for you, right? Typically you're using 80% split. You can also use a slider, but I typically just use the, um, just, use, just type it here. Okay, so I've already done that, so I'm gonna do that again. But let's look at the data set in more detail. So let's click at details first. All right, so what do we see here, right? Um, so this is just a very quick overview of the data set. Uh, and what the HDO does is automatically detects what kind of value it is. You can see here ID is integer, um, sex is string, and education, um, in this case, integer, because it's, uh, it's values, right? So basically, the data set given was actually values. And then depending on the, the range of the values, it either provides you this kind of a bar chart, or if it's a yes or no, or boolean, or uh, in this case, only two values. It gives you um, this kind of chart, right? And if it's just uh, discrete values, but very few of them, it gives you this kind of uh, line chart. So uh, the other thing it does is also, like I said, missing values. In this case, of course, I'm fortunate enough to have a very nice data set, 
but in real life, you're not going to have this, right? So if they're missing values, it also brings it up uh, to your attention. Like I say, it does handle it uh, if you don't handle it. But again, uh, depending on the, call, the, the the skill level of the data scientist who's using it, too, they might want to handle it themselves. But I think it provides also mean and stuff. So if you look at the age, you can see the youngest is 21, oldest is 79, mean age is 35, uh, and so forth. You can also look at the raw uh, information here. So this is the raw CSV file, right? Just to just a kind of a, you know, just if you are curious about it. Um, you can also do modification. Let's say if you find an error here, you want to modify, you can actually write your own Python code, um, you know, and uh, basically do that as well. So you have something called live code, right? You just put it in and then you will modify the, the data set for you. Okay, going back to the overview, right? So this is kind of pretty much, uh, you know, pretty, pretty cool stuff. But let's uh, look at something a bit more interesting. Visualization. Uh, okay, where's the visualization? Okay, typically you, yeah, it's almost immediate. Okay. So visualization, so what happens is based on the data set that was given to the H2O, it will generate different graphs, right, that it thinks are relevant to the data set. So it's not gonna show you, um, so it really depends. This thing will change based on different data sets that you upload. Um, in my own experience, the most important things are outliers. So let's look at outliers first. So in this case, you can see um, what is telling you here is that for the <coughs> feature pay amount two, uh, most of them are between, you know, you can see from zero to 200, 200K, and there's a couple of them that are really far away, right? And you can click on them as well. So if you click on the red here, um, you can actually see, sorry, what's this column again? This is pay amount two. Right, so you can actually scroll this and pay amount so you can see that um, the value here. So it's really far away from uh, the majority of it, right? So, so again, it depends, right? Is this, uh, because especially when you're working with real life data sets, sometimes it could be an input error um, and so forth, right? So this kind of highlights to you, to the, to the person doing this, whether it's a data anal an analyst or a data scientist, that hey, there are kind of a couple of weird uh, kind of values that are really far. For example, here for pay amount one, right? There's a single value here that's really far away from everything else. Uh, pay amount three. So you will actually automatically identify all this and kind of showcase it to you. Look, uh, you know, for bill amount here, you've got something that's close to a million dollars. So this this is really useful for the data scientists. Uh, again, right, we're talking about garbage in, garbage out. So you want to make sure that this data points are actually real. Uh, and, and it's up to the data scientist whether he wants to remove them or not, right? Because Again, with machine learning, you are trying to find a pattern, um, and you know, with just one single data point, you, you know, it, it it might not really help the model. So, uh, you know, typically, that you know, you might want to leave it in, or you might just want to take it out. Um, the other thing that I think is very interesting is correlation graph, um, and what this does is basically it automatically tries to find linear correlations between uh, between the different features. So of course we are looking at default as our target column, right? So if I'm gonna put it all the way there, sorry here, okay, 1.98. Uh, you can see there's a high correlation of someone defaulting to the sex and marriage. Um, so yeah, there's somehow a high correlation. Well, it could be that uh, maybe the most people who default are men, right? Uh, and it could be because most of the people who apply for loans are men. Uh, that could be one reason. And the other one is also there's a relation between the marriage marital status and default. Well, again, it could be because maybe people who are married tend to have more uh, financial responsibilities, right, compared to someone who's single, who might have less, right? So, so, so this really out of the box without even running the machine learning algorithm, uh, they show you some very, uh, you know, some of the correlations out there. Of course, you have to be careful of data leakage, right? So if you're a data scientist, you have to make sure that if it's too highly correlated, um, it's also not good, right? Uh, because then uh, it's, you know, it, it, that's typically why you look at data leakage, right? Then, then basically that's the only column that's gonna help you predict. So you might wanna be also be uh, wary of that as well, right? So this really helps you to, to look at that. Okay, so um, the rest I won't go through in the interest of time. So what I'm doing next is really to show you how to run this experiment. Let's, so let's go back to data set. Uh, click number two, or number three, sorry. Okay, how do you train the data set? Okay, since I already done the split, right, you just right click and then do uh, predict. 
Okay, so not now, um, and I just put some name. I'm not going to run this because there's already already ran it, and it's not going to it's going to take. Well, again, just run and then terminate. Maybe that's what I'll do. Uh, but so you select your target column. Automatically, it, it detects how many rows there are, how many columns. It takes a uh, target column here, and again, it's about you want to predict default. And automatically, based on that, it tells you, okay, I'm, you're, it seems that you're predicting a boolean variable with only two unique values, right? It's a yes or no. Um, and I find 23,999 values, right? Um, yes is uh, 5,000. So out of uh, all the values, 5,000 are actually yes. Um, automatically, it tries, it, it tries based on the data set, uh, try to set up some of these settings. So you can see here, you can adjust this if you want uh, accuracy as well. Of course, you want to do more, but it'll take longer time. Uh, time setting, um, you can again, longer means you know, you'll do more iterations. Interpretability is how, you know, how interpretable do you want the models to be, right? If you put it to max, then you'll try to use uh, simpler models, right, rather than more complex models. Scorer is basically choosing based on the data set you uh, recommend, in this case, uh, area under curve or AUC. Uh, and again, you can change this and you can also add your own, uh, your own uh, scorers as well if you want. So you can see here, okay, right now with this setting, you can see something it's using uh, a couple of GLS like GBM, XGBoost and so forth. Let's say you, you know, you're there and you say, hey, I want to use CatBoost, right? I think CatBoost is going to be really good for this, uh, this use case. Um, and, but he still doesn't have it, right? So what do I do? So don't fear, right? You never fear. You go to expert settings here, just to show you. I mean, I clicked it a bit too fast. So right here, you can see expert settings, click on that. Um, and you see this thing, upload custom recipe, load and official recipe. So if you click on official recipes, it's going to click a new, and you can see that it brings you to the GitHub page, right? And you can see, um, yeah, so you can see all the models that, uh, that either H2 has uploaded or um, here you can see, or even uh, other, some, it's open source, so it's up to anyone to actually provide these models. So you can see here under algorithms, you also have transformers as well and scorers as well. Right. Um, so transformers, for example, you can see in this case, uh, for example, I'm in Singapore, so uh, they do provide a transformer for you to indicate whether a date is uh, false on a Singapore holiday. Right. So you don't have to actually do everything yourself, which is what you have to do typically if you're if you're a data scientist doing it. Right. Um, you have to go and kind of figure out do this yourself. So it makes it much simpler. So let's say I'll use CatBoost here as I mentioned. So let's click on CatBoost. Right. It brings you to the GitHub page for CatBoost. And then you just click raw, right? You go to the raw page, uh, do a control C or copy, and then go back. And then you do load custom recipe, and you do a control V, and you do save. And that's pretty much it, right? It starts pulling it down. And, you know, with uh, luck, you'll see it, right? And what happens is that, okay, once you add it, it doesn't automatically use it. Uh, you have to go and add it. So here you can see, um, let's say I want to use, uh, so I want to force H2 to use CatBoost. So in this case, I go to recipes, I go to select values, and then just say CatBoost, right? And that's it. And then if I do a save here, you can see that uh, CatBoost will show up here. Right, you can see here. All right, and then that's pretty much it, right? It's a classification problem, right? So again, it automatically detects it. Of course, you can change it into a regression problem by clicking that, right? Uh, and here, it automatically uh, uses GPUs as well. And then you just click launch experiment. And that's pretty much it, right? Um, so again, um, no Python coding required. Well, not say, but of course there are some data scientists who say, you know what, I, wanna, I don't wanna use this UI because I'm a hardcore programmer and I wanna use my Python notebooks and you know, uh, does that mean I can't use H2? Um, no. So you they also provide, uh, you know, all the APIs as well that you can call from the uh, Jupyter Notebook or even R Studio as well. Okay, um, yeah. So automatically, H2 will also tell you some things. Hey, you know, data seems slightly imbalanced um, and all that. So these are all messages that come up. Um, and again, they try to. They sometimes they will tell you things to do. So if it's an imbalanced data, there's also a setting within the expert setting uh, for you to enable um, uh, sampling, data sampling. So I did not uh, switch that on, right? Uh, but that's something that you can also switch on uh, so that if it's a highly imbalanced data set, then uh, it, will, it will do some data sampling in order to handle the imbalance. So here it tells you, okay, you know, around, um, you know, imbalance ratio is around one to 3.5. Okay, so what's happening right now? 
is um, it, so this tool is going to do a lot of experiments. So every dot here is actually one experiment. So you can see a light GBM. Uh, and it's going to keep trying until it gets the best uh, possible uh, AUC score, right? So it is an area under, under curve score. At the same time, it's actually creating, uh, looking at the variables as well. Uh, depending on the data set, it might uh, generate features as well, right? So in this case, it's not generating features, but if you're looking at more complex data sets, it actually generates its own features, right? And this is a whole part of feature engineering. Um, so you keep generating features, um, you know, um, uh, again and again, and trying out these new features to see whether you can improve the performance of the model, um, you know? So, so that's basically what it does, okay? And then here you can see GPU usage is actually using so that's the reason why it really leverages on GPUs because it's running many experiments at, at a time with different parameters, right? Uh, if you're a data scientist, you're gonna do it one at a time, try with one model and then try another and then you're gonna write all these different code and stuff. So imagine, you can just imagine the amount of time that you actually save by using this, even as a data scientist, right? Um, so you save a lot of time with all this kind of uh, very tedious manual work. Um, and, and then uh, basically, you know, save your time to actually kind of maybe, uh, you know, do, 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 do things that are, that are a bit more high level, okay? Um, I'm not gonna let this run, right? Um, you know, actually I can let it run, not an issue. So let me look at the results, right? So let's look at the results and let's go to the projects. So in his tool, you have a concept of projects because you, you're not going to run one experiment, right? Of course, every data scientist knows you're not going to be happy with one, you're going to tweak it around, uh, you know, and, and so forth, right? So, and if you want to see the result for it, right? So this is a project where you can uh, group multiple experiments together. So let's say I want to see the result, uh, the scoring, right? I want to test the scoring. So I'm going to click this. I'm going to use the test data set that I created. Uh, I'm going to use AUC. And then I'm going to click score item, right? So complete that. And here's where you can see things like your confusion matrix and so forth, right? So, yeah, so it's basically showing you, um, you know, the different uh, matrix here. You can see your confusion matrix here, right? And so forth. So everything is auto generated, your lift chart, ROC again, and so forth. So um, all this is all documented as well. And then that's a key thing that I just want to, you know, uh, emphasize, right? The, it, everything is, um, you know, it's, it's documented um, and so that you, you know, um, it's good for auditing purposes and stuff. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to show you, so you can move away from it. So you can see this thing is still training. Uh, you don't have to stay on the screen, right? Okay. The other thing that I want to show is really, okay. So let's say the model has been trained in this case. Now I want to look at explaining the model. Okay. Explaining the model. So that's under MLI. Um, and what we have here is, uh, let's go here. The credit card use case is not that interesting, to be honest. But, uh, maybe I'll, if I have time now, I'll show you the, the telco use case as well. All right, so click on card. Okay, so let's quickly go to uh, think feature importance first. Okay, so this is the model that was generated, right? And uh, what it tells you here is that, so if it creates uh, uh, its own features, right, then you'll see transform. So I'm gonna go original, right? But in this case, it doesn't matter because there, there was no, um, no created features, generated features. So here it says the, uh, the features that are most important is status, right? So status has a high correlation to the result. So again, you have to be careful of, uh, you know, data leakage and stuff, right? So this is where data scientists might want to look at further into the data and see. So other things that are very important is the credit limit um, as well as the bill amount. So according to this, these are the three, uh, in a general sense, this, this three are the highest um, uh, indicators of uh, credit card default. The other thing that you wanna, I want to show you is uh, the surrogate models as well. And let me just go to the dashboard here. So. So of course, uh, especially when you're using ensemble models, right? Um, you might want to explain, um, like say you want to explain the results of the models. So we actually create a couple of surrogate models here. You can see a random forest, um, a decision tree here, and so forth. Uh, and Lime as well, right? So Lime, of course, if you're again, you're a data scientist who's working in this space of uh, explainability, you should be very familiar with Lime. So if you look at maybe one of the uh, observations here, 
right? So you can see here, okay. So in this case, for row 22647, um, the actual model prediction was 0.74. The line prediction also uh, detected as a, as a default 0.79. And the reason codes are status one, bill amount three, status four, right? So what does these numbers mean? So you can click on explanations here. So what this means is that, um, so it tells you, okay, um, what the reason why this was flagged as a default was basically based on because of this top three features. So status one was one and that contributes 20% to it uh, being a default, okay? Uh, bill amount uh, contributes around 8.9%, uh, you know, and status four is 0.07%. Uh, is so these three together, uh, you know, basically is kind of, uh, kind of uh, the reason why the model uh, considered this uh, default, right? They are the biggest factors in the model predicting it as default. It also gives you the top negative values as well. So it says, um, so these are the three, uh, three values that uh, kind of make it less likely to default, right? So in this case, the bill amount being uh, this amount, right, in that row, uh, provided a decrease of around 5% towards not default and so forth, so forth. So this is very useful, again, for, I know you can export it in CSV and stuff. So it's useful for, uh, again, to explain, and, and also, like I say, you can provide uh, documentation as well. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is uh, something called disparate impact analysis. Uh, and this is something uh, that they added recently, right? And this is really for bias detection. And uh, of course, maybe for default, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, well, I don't know, it's questionable whether it's important, but if you're going to have something like a model to uh, approve loans, right? Then you want to make sure that there is no bias in this. And how you can do this is that how you can do this is basically this this kind of graph tells you how the the feature affects affects the result. Sorry, affects the result. So in this case, if I'm looking at sex, um, you know, it it it's there is a, a bit of a imbalance um, in, in some of the cases where um, sex does play a part in the final result, right? Um, so there is basically a lot of the, um, you know, maybe it could be a lot of the uh, defaults are actually male, right? Uh, you can tell here, female, sorry, female. So, so you, so these are very useful. And uh, okay, to understand all this, you do need a fair bit of statistics background uh, because this is really about data and stuff, right? But it's a really good start in order for you to uh, detect bias in your, in your, um, you know, in your model, right? And um, and the other thing that we also pro they provide is uh, the documentation is really good. Let me just switch to the documentation here. Yeah, so you can see they have tutorials and documentation where they explain uh, step by step how do you, uh, you know, what this thing means. Because of course it is a fairly technical uh, product. Uh, and I would say you would need at least a data analyst to understand some of these terms, right? Uh, to, you know, basically uh, in terms of um, precision, recall, your F1 score and so forth. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. So just something to show you here. Um, the final thing that I really want to show you is um, let me just go back here. Um, something called the two other things. I'm just gonna click on a random experiment here. So two things. Like I said uh, you can deploy this on the cloud as well or local. So you can automatically deploy on the Amazon Lambda if you want. Uh, you can use this as a REST API, uh, or you can also download it as well. So you provide both download uh, Python and Java as well. So in this case, you do not need the software to be on the, on the server they're going to deploy it on. Uh, finally, there's also an auto report function, right? Um, so you can actually uh, download the document here. And this basically gives you everything that I showed and even more. Yeah, since I'm using LibreOffice, I hope the formatting doesn't screw up. Um, yeah, so everything, uh, what transformers was used, uh, what score was used, what's the final model, um, you know, yeah, what's the final model. So it's actually, a, a, you know, a light, three light GBMs. Uh, every setting is here. So again, in terms of, uh, from a, you know, auditing purpose, uh, this is very useful. Because uh, if you're a data scientist, you know that you hate to do all this documentation, right? This is one of the things that people really hate to do. Uh, confusion matrix for validation as well as tests and so forth. Okay, so yeah, so that's basically I wanted to show, right? Um, so again, this is something you can do yourself. And let me go back to the slide. 
Okay, I'm kind of uh, overrunning a bit, so I'm going to try and uh, speed up the last few. Let me just go full screen here. Okay, so you can do this yourself. Like say the website is aquarium.hto.ai. Um, just go to Lab4. You've got two hours to run um, run this, right? Use the training uh, username. It's also mentioned there. And you can run as many times as you want, right, to understand the software. So this is how it looks. Uh, very straightforward. Okay. Um, the tutorial is here as well. So all these, again, I'll provide you the slides. Um, there's a booklet with every aspect of the, you know, of the software that you can do, uh, what you can do, what you can't do, and so forth, right, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is the end of my presentation. Okay, I see a question here. Okay, so there's a question by, by Franco. Um, the question is, does <coughs> yeah, driver's AI deal with missing data and values? So yes, um, uh, well, I would say it depends, okay? <coughs> if your data has a lot of missing values, right? if most of your data is missing, then obviously there's, uh, you know, it's not gonna work, right? Uh, but if your data, data is, um, has only a few missing values, right? Uh, where it's still acceptable, then H2 actually handles the data, the missing values. How it handles it is that it treats it as a separate category, right? So that's what it does. It, does. it takes out the missing values. Uh, and it, well, that's one way of doing it. So it depends on uh, the data set. So based on the data set, it will handle uh, the missing values differently. For example, if it knows that it's an age column, then it sometimes it will use different techniques. It could be uh, using median, or using mean and so forth, right? So again, typically that's what data scientists does as well. Um, you know, let's say if you have, because for example, real life data, you might not have the age of everyone, but you still have to fill it in. Then you kind of based on your domain knowledge, um, you know, and based on the overall data set, you know, what, you, you know what to fill in, right? Because you have to make a guess, a kind of educated guess. So that's something that H2 also does as well uh, to a degree. Of course, the best example is if you, you have the data scientist, uh, who is the domain expert, would know what are the best values to fill in. But yes, H2O does uh, handle that as well. All right, so that's, uh, hope that answered your question. Any other, um, any other questions from the few? Yeah, okay. Um, I think if there's anyone who would like to ask questions, just message on Q&A. So while waiting for a question, I have a question, um, Gilbert, as to what you sure. have, um, shared a while ago. Um, in terms of um, uh, which type of, uh, were you able to show like models as to how it could be part of the um, driverless AI, right? So you can actually just use GitHub to like add more um, models there. Um, is there a way right. for you to, to validate that, that if that model will work? Like is there, that, is there like a document that needs to be followed that would be... Yes that needs yeah. to be done for, for a data scientist like to create one model, you need to follow this format. Um, okay, that's a good question. Yes, so the answer to that is uh, yes. Maybe let me just show you. So there is a uh, documentation uh, on the h website. Let me just uh, bring that up quickly if I can find it. Uh, and even on the GitHub, there is a template model for you. Okay. So you need to be able to um, let me just quickly do that. Let me see if I can find it. Ah, I'm, I'm, let me search then I'll share my screen. Sure. Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah, see. Okay, 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 I found it. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so they do have steps here. So there's a, let me see, bring your own recipe. Yeah, okay, so then, uh, here you go. So they have uh, some documentation in you know, a custom machine learning, um, extending the H2O webinar as well, where they give you examples and so forth. So basically, yeah, you, you, you just have to follow, uh, write the Python code, uh, make sure that you follow it and uh, you're good to go. If you look at the, um, the GitHub as well, let me try and see if I can bring, there's the GitHub. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. If you look at the GitHub, well, there's also a template model for you to look at as well. Okay. Um, yeah, how to write a model. Yeah, how to write a recipe. Um, yeah, so they give you, see, they give you all this information in the GitHub as well, right? So yeah. So yes, uh, yes. Um, so that's all provided. All right. Um, just one more question. Um, I think in terms of um, serving the the model itself, um, how do you serve it? Like, is there is there a way for you to like reuse the model that was built? So for example, you have seen a while ago that you can build various experiments, right? And that, that list of experiments, from the model that you have selected, um, would yield uh, a specific like accuracy, or it would identify which model fits, um, which configuration um, would definitely fit the, the data set that you have. Um, is there a way for you to use yeah. that model to perform like um, predictions? So for example, I have a new role of data now that can actually, I, and I need to like process this um, row if it would, in, in the context of like a default, um, uh, a further credit card default data, uh, I would want now to, or for the upcoming data to analyze and like do the predictions immediately. So the way for me to, use that model um, on serving it, for example, by an API? Um, are you talking about retraining with the additional data? Or are you talking about scoring? I'm more on the scoring part. So I'm just going to use the model okay. to score the new Ah, okay, uh, okay. New okay. Right, right. So scoring, uh, okay, let me, um, so as I showed be earlier, right, uh, there's a way for you to generate a REST API from the server itself. Okay. Uh, that's one way. Right, and then you just use the REST API uh, uh, against your new data set. The other way is, let me just show, share my screen again, sorry, so that looks a bit clearer. Uh, here you go. So two ways of doing it. Uh, one, like I said, um, if you, simplest way, you have a REST API, you can deploy that and then use that uh, and test it against your data set. The other way is to download the scoring pipeline. Mm -hmm. So in this case, if I click a download, um, yeah, here you go, download. And what, this is quite useful, so that any, once you download, it gives you a, a bash script, as well as um, um, a, the, a sample data set for you to try. Right. Um, and then you basically just uh, run it and get the results, right? So the results will come out on the screen itself. So this are pretty, uh, the two ways of doing it. You can also Python and R as well. So that's how typically you uh, use the model. The other way is uh, to just say score on another data set. Right, so the other way is just keep the model here. Don't do any REST API. Um, just go to the, um, like what I show you, the projects, right? Uh, and, then, and then just, um, yeah, just click uh, scoring and then uh, select the data set. Oh, I, think my, I think my time ran out. <laughs> yeah, my H2O ran out already. Yeah. Right, okay, so just let to me... summarize, like the way for you to use it is you can um, use it as a REST API, and then you can also download it as a bash. And then uh, other, um, another option is like you just upload a data set and just you can, we can use the That's right. um, same um, scoring model to like score the data set that we have uploaded. Okay. Correct, exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's, and, and I say, right, it's something you can test on yourself with the Aquarium website as well. Um, only thing the the downloading won't work because you need the license because once you download the model to run it on a, your desktop or whatever you need the model so you can't test that with the aquarium uh, with the aquarium software um, uh, but yeah you can try all the rest. All right. Okay. Okay. I think um, that's all. Um, if you guys don't have any questions, um, um, thanks for listening. Um, thank you also, Gilbert, for your time um, with us. Oh, and I, I think, think Mike. Um, Sorry, yeah. I think Mike wanted to talk about the server, right? Uh, I think they, Mike, do you want to like run through like two minutes or three minutes? Uh, do you have time, uh, Ralph? Yeah, I think we still have. Um, if you would want to like um, share, Mike, a few, if we just like for two minutes or. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Gilbert, yeah. Okay. Let me try to select some part. Yeah, so as Mike's setting it up, yeah, just to let you know, one thing we, one thing we do is, uh, especially for education, right? Um, since the license is free for NU, uh, IBM does provide, uh, you know, like I said, we, we can provide the server, we install H2O, we configure, and we do a simple training for customers who buy, uh, buy our server as well. So that's something we do. Um, and, you know, so, uh, 
So typically, because it's machine learning, you don't really need a V100. Um, so we, we have servers with T-Force, which is actually quite decent. You're only getting around 4 to 5% performance uh, decrease compared to the V100. So uh, this is pretty uh, decent. Uh, what we're showing here is um, this is basically more of a POC as well. So if you don't have, you know, if you're a client and you want to deploy AI in an environment, but you don't have skills and you don't know what to do, um, then we actually uh, do POCs for you, proof of concept and stuff like that as well. Yeah. Uh, Mike, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, Gilbert, thanks for that. So what you've seen in this uh, presentations are the basic features that uh, IBM offers in terms of uh, demo packages, uh, as you see in the first column, the POC packages, the pilot, and the advanced edition. So these are some sort of bundled packages in terms of having the H2O AI um, as you would like to to try it for yourself first. So we we can have the demo package first as something that you would like to explore it on. Then if you will think that you are on a company that has something that has an AI project and would like to have some pilot tests or some proof of concept, uh, you can message us, um, uh, Gilbert and I, or you can stay, say it to Ralph, uh, that we, we, we can talk about these uh, packages here. Um, we don't have much time, but I would like to say about that in IBM systems or in IBM hardware, we do have what we call the, uh, the, AI, the AI servers, okay? Uh, you see here in the right, right uh, bottom below, uh, it mentions about the IC922. IC922 is a, we call it the inference compute server, where it has its own GPU. Uh, it's a NVIDIA, in NVIDIA T4. It's a PCIe Gen 4 uh, uh, GPU that is meant for inference. Um, it's not indicated here. We also have something what we call the AC922 or the accelerated computing uh, servers. Uh, what it does is that it's meant for men for training. Uh, training and inference are two different parts of uh, um, AI modeling or the AI ladder that we are having in, in our field. Um, probably in, in other times we can, I can continue on this one, Ralph, and uh, mention more about the system servers. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, so if you are new, if you're an EDU customer, right, if you belong to NST and all that, and you're interested in maybe how to get an EDU license, and, uh, you know, you can contact Michael or me, and we can kind of uh, help you with that. Okay, I think that's, that's pretty much it for us. All right. Um, thank you so much for uh, sharing all of those information. Um, if you guys don't have any questions, um, I'll be um, sharing the, the links that uh, Gilbert will be providing so that you can... Um, get to know more about um, SNAP ML and if you would want to start um, exploring those libraries and exploring those technologies to enable um, you guys to um, use them for your projects, then uh, we'll be sharing all of those information too. Yeah, thank you so much again, Gilbert, for your time and Mike. So, uh, and um, yeah, thanks, for, thanks everyone for your time as well for joining us tonight. Okay, bye-bye. All right, thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, thank you.